I'm going to examine some special trigonometric integrals, which, as it turns out, form the foundation for the topic of Fourier series. If you're studying Fourier series, you'll certainly need to be familiar with these integrals and how they work. On the other hand, if you're not yet studying Fourier series, it's still a useful exercise to look at these integrals, because they teach us a lot about the use of some of the trigonometric formulae. So, in fact, I need to start by writing down some of the formulae I'm going to use. To begin with, I will write down the sum and difference formulae for the sine and cosine. As the name suggests, these tell us how to expand the sine or the cos of a sum or difference of two angles in terms of the sine and cos of the individual angles. They look like this. In order to refer to them later, I've numbered them 1 to 4. Be careful of the plus and minus signs here. They are correct the way I've written them. It's not a mistake. We can get some more out of these formulae. It's useful, for example, to set A and B to be equal. On the left-hand side, then, you can see that two of the formulae will give sine or cosine of 2A, while the other two will give something that disappears. In the case of the sine A minus B, or gives 1 in the case of the cos A minus B. It's the two formulae with pluses on the left-hand side that I want to use here. So let's put A equals B. Finally, the double angle formula for cos shown here can be rearranged to make either cos squared A or sine squared A the subject. We then get the following. We will need all of these formulae as we pass through this recording. Well, now it's time to introduce the integrals that we want to examine. There are three kinds. They look like this. In the first one, the integrand is a product of two signs. But notice they are different signs. One contains an N, while the other contains an M. The letter capital T is related to the period of the function whose Fourier series we might be interested in. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry. Just treat the integral at its face value and watch what happens with it. The other two kinds of integral are very much like this one. One contains a cos times a cos, and the other contains a sine times a cos. I'll write those here now and number them. OK, that's all of them. Let's start by integrating number 9. The integrand here has the form sine times sine, with the signs different. Does that remind you of anything? Let's go back and look at formulae 1 and 2, and 3 and 4. Can we see a sine times a sine anywhere? Well, actually, yes, we can. We can see that form in formulae 3 and 4. The trouble is there's cos times cos there as well. But we could get rid of the cos cos term, for example, by subtracting number 3 from number 4. That would give us two of the sine sine term. OK, so I'll say that again. Formula 4, subtract formula 3. The cos cos on the right-hand side disappears, and the sine sine gets doubled, because we have negative times minus 1 there. Let's write that out below. I've done the subtraction, but you'll notice that I've also divided both sides by 2, so I've got exactly sine times sine. I now have to go to my integral 9 and identify the a as n pi t over t and the b as m pi t over t. That gives me the following. The new version is now easy to integrate. In fact, we just get a difference of two signs. Here's the result. And we can put in the integration limits. And can you see that when we put little t equal to capital T, there will be cancellation inside the signs. So we'll end up with just sine of n minus m pi and sine of n plus m pi. I perhaps should have said at the beginning that little n and little m are being assumed here to be integers, whole numbers. And so we have sine of whole numbers of pi. In both cases, that just gives us zero for this integral. There is, however, just one small hitch here. Look at the coefficients that have turned up outside those signs at the end. 1 over n minus m and 1 over n plus m are involved. We haven't anywhere said that n 
is not the same as m, or come to that, the same as minus m. If either of those two things were to happen, we would find that we are dividing by zero. That means that the integral no longer makes sense. The answer here is only true if n is not equal to plus or minus m. So we must say that. When this sort of thing happens, it's telling us that we must go back to the start and do the whole thing again for those special cases. I'm just going to do the case n equals m here. That's because in Fourier series we normally take the n and the m both to be positive. You can do it for n equals minus m separately if you wish. So let's go back to the original integral 9 and put n equals m. Now both the signs in the integral are the same, so we get sine squared, and we have to choose either n or m. I'll choose n, so we get sine squared n pi t over t. But that's OK because one of our other formulae told us how to deal with sine squared in terms of double angles. It's formula 7, no sorry 8 in the middle here. Sine squared equals a half 1 minus cos 2a. So let's replace sine squared with that version using cos of the double angle. And once again we can do the integral. Just as before there's a part that disappears when we put in the limits sine of 2n pi and sine of minus 2n pi are both zero. But this time there is also a surviving piece that comes from the half t that starts the expression. When we put in the limits we'll get a half times 2 capital T in other words an answer of capital T not zero anymore. So that's dealt with the integral 9. At this point we probably should summarize what we've learned. We can write out both results this way. Ready to move on. I'll go a little bit quicker now and summarize things without quite so much detail. Number 10 is the same kind of integral but now with cos times cos. Just as we did with the signs we need to isolate a term cos times cos in the sum and difference formulae. I guess it looks this time as though we need to add formulae 3 and 4. That'll get rid of the sine sine term. So let's do that. I'll write out the results below. Look for a moment at what happened in number 9. All that's going to happen now in number 10 is that instead of subtracting the cosines in that integral we're adding them. So I'm just, I'm just going to copy that formula with a plus in the middle instead of a minus. And then performing the integration will work exactly as before but just with that extra sign. With now the benefit of hindsight we should also immediately make the comment that n and m must not be equal. And then just as in example 9 substituting the limits capital T and negative t causes both those signs to disappear. We must then again address the case n equal to m separately. I'll leave it to you to check on paper what we get. I'll just tell you the result. Of course the only difference to the integral 9 was that minus sign that changed to a plus and we can see that here. It's plus the cos instead of minus. So just like in integral 9 when we integrate the cosine we get a sign and that term will disappear when we put the limits in. So we get just capital T again for this integral. So that's number 10 done as well. That leaves 11. 11 was the mixed one with sine times cosine. Let's look at our sum and difference formula one last time. This time it's numbers 1 and 2 that contain the term we want, sine times cos. To get sine times cos we need to add 1 and 2. That'll give us 2 sine a cos b on the right and the sum of the two signs with the sum and difference on the left. Let's go straight to integral 11 and use that feature. Here's the result. We'll do the integral immediately for the case n not equal to plus or minus m. I've moved the t over pi out to the front because I know it appears in both terms. Also remember that anti-differentiating sign gives negative cos so there's a minus at the front. The process of putting in the integration limits is a little bit different this time because we don't get stuff that disappears, at least not initially. Let's see what happens. As before, putting little t equal to capital T in those trig functions causes the t's to cancel. 
Now we get cos of whole numbers of pi. But now bear in mind that cosine is an even function. That means that cos of positive an angle is equal to cos of negative an angle. So these terms actually cancel each other in pairs. The first and the third, and the second and the fourth. So once again we get zero, albeit in a slightly more complicated manner. Then it just remains to look at the special case n equal to m. Actually, rather than going all the way back to the double angle formulae, we could just substitute n equal to m in the integral expression we see here, before it was integrated. When n is equal to m, the sine term with n minus m gives a sine of 0, which is 0, while that with n plus m gives 2n. So that gives us, finally, our last integral to do. Here's the integral. And here's the result, into which we must substitute the integration limits. But then once again, because cos is an even function, those two angles, 2n pi and negative 2n pi, have the same cosine. So we get cancellation. The integral is 0. So in fact, unlike integrals 9 and 10, number 11 is actually 0 for all values of n and m not just for those when n and m are not equal to plus or minus each other. Let's go back and summarise the results. First, the one we've just done, number 11. It's 0 for all n and m. Then 9 and 10 are equal to t when n and m are equal, but 0 otherwise. The only thing that's omitted here is the case when n is equal to negative m. I'll leave you to fill in that gap yourself.